Does that work? Yes. I'm going to get my number one boy here, Bob Hall. Help me out a little bit on some of this. Some of it will pass out. You can look at it. Let's get to it. I want all of you to know that I love you. If I didn't, I wouldn't be here today. Because the University of Kentucky is playing basketball right now. And I miss it. So you people got to know I love you. Come down. Today I'm going to talk to you about Revolutionary War soldiers, their uniforms, misconceptions about the uniforms, and a few facts that are known about these items. Now, I'm not going to go into great detail or anything because I've got too much to cover in a little bit of time. But life in the Continental Army was difficult. It was mundane and monotonous. Generally, when not engaged in combat, soldiers in the Continental Army served three duties. Fatigue or manual labor, such as, well, they call it digging balls, but it was the trends. Clearing fields or erecting fortifications. They also served on guard duty and drilled naval with their muskets and in marching formation. First, we're going to feed an army. Militia units in the Continental Army were completely different. Most of the militia stores or food supplies were what they could find to kill. Militia usually operated in a more localized area. Now, Revolutionary War soldiers dated ration on the march. If they were on the march, they got one, supposedly, they, they didn't always get this, very seldom, they really ever got it from reports I've read through different books. If they got one pound of beef and a half cup of flour. They'd cook the beef on a stick over the fire. Those lucky enough to get the rations of flour would mix water, making a doughy thick paste. They'd slap them on flat rock and sand the rock up facing the fire. After it cooked on the outside, they would eat it, although it probably was still a little sticky on the inside. Rebel was simply at daybreak, and soldiers cooked one meal per day, generally around 3 o'clock in the afternoon. Whatever food was left over from the meal, Soldiers would stick in their haversacks, sacks, nap sacks, any way they could keep it. And that was breakfast the next morning. Each man was to receive one and a half pound of meat per day. That was supposed to keep them in fighting for them. Typically beef. Each hunt they received included not only meat, but bones, fats, gristle, or one and a half pounds, and then they got one and a half pounds of flour to make fire cakes. Fire cakes were like a pancake. Soldiers heated a flat rock, then mixed the flour with water. Meat, gristle, and poured a mixture on a heated rock. They would flip it over and cook the other side. They call these fire cakes. Soldiers also received two ounces of spirit a day to be added to the water in the canteens to kill vermin or other things that could be found floating in the water. <clears throat> now, if he was in camp, which was one of the forts, he got ten biscuits of hard cake. Now, even though some campsites had a bakery and actually baked bread, let's talk about this little thing called hardtack. The 
first ship's biscuits, as they were called. Biscuit bread, hard tack. Goes back to the ancient Romans when they were conquering Britain. These simple biscuit like breads were baked at low temperatures multiple times. Longer voyages or campaigns of six to eight months would have seen this biscuit bread baked at least four times. This was cooked in the larger cities and shipped to the troops in boats. This process of multiple baking removed as much moisture as possible and even pasteurized the bread. After being baked hard, if it was kept dry, it could safely last for years. If it was stored properly, pests would not infest the bread biscuits. This biscuit bread is a forerunner of the bread used in the Civil War called hardtack. Most often, the hard tap was softened by drinking, by dunking it into a brine salt water solution, or in their tea or other liquid, or cooked in soups or stews and skillet meals. Early recipes used chicken and broth added hard tap to soften it and thicken the broth, and hence that it was the first evolution of chicken and dumplings. I'll be more pacing this time. Make look at it. We'll bring it back up a little later. First thing we got was a cup of dried meat. A cup of dried meat. This was this was a day's ration. They got ten biscuits for hard to have. It's a hard time. I've had it sorted out. This is hard time that they not cooked about four years ago. And it, it right now it's about the same as it was. Now you can break it, it will break. This is of course, uh, been in, uh, in and out of hot cold and everything else, so it, it is deteriorated some. We take it to schools, pass it out, tell the kids, now don't try to bite it because you can't break it. And then they will going to see a half a dozen little less of sitting out there and they're pounding it to see if they can break it or not. You got a pound of meat. This would be a cup of dried jerky. <laughs> so they got a pound of meat of the dried jerky. They take the meat, which usually, in all honesty, was soft pork. There's lots of hogs, and the pork was easily kept by salting it down. And uh, the beef would keep unless you dried it in turkey. So the biggest part of what they had was salt pork. They put it in a pot, cooked the beans, seasoned with the salt pork or turkey, and with the hard tack soaking in the pot too. Because you had to soak this stuff to soften it. When we were cooking it, we cooked it about four times. 200 degrees for two hours. You just, it's a real slow cook. They got a cup of rum. That'd be a cup. Got the rum. Water now. They didn't want them drunk. This was used. Does anybody know what rum is made from? Molasses. Sugar. Cane sugar, molasses. That's what rum is made from. It's full of all kinds of vitamins. Minerals, and I don't know how to put this politely, but it would help keep the soldiers going every day and going and going. That's why they do the drinks. You get yeah. that's why they had to run. They got a corner, a cup of corn. 
coarse ground cornmeal. It's cornmeal, but it's a coarse ground. They would take this coarse ground cornmeal and make a mush of it. When I was a kid, my mom made mush all the time. We loved it. That's a southern thing, I guess. We would fight over what we left. Really Cornmeal was cooked into a semi-paste, like grits or mush, or some people call it that. The soldiers then would add jam, jelly, honey, molasses, fruit, anything they could find with it was kind of sweet. And they called it, and I've heard this on the live because I never knew it, hasty pudding. It's hasty pudding. Now, I often join men in camp or on the march were women and children. They were known as camp followers. The women were mostly wives of the enlisted men. And George Washington, as those people think that camp followers were women tonight. George Washington prohibited women of questionable virtue to accompany his army. He didn't do that. As well as all the stories that have told and been told and over and over again about camp followers or women of the night, it wasn't so because he didn't allow it. A sad note is women in camp got half rations. The wives would do sewing, mending, washing clothes. Children in camp got quarter rations. Children had the chores and carrying the firewood and things like that. Now every sixth man received a steel cooking pot. Men were divided into six man tent mates or cooking mates. When on long marches, it was said you could trace the troops backward by following the trail of head and cast iron pots <laughs> along the land along the roadways. Got to have a sip here. Matt. Spanish dollars 
for why he circulated. Colonial governments sometimes issued paper money to help the economic activity. The British Parliament passed currency acts in 1751, 1754, uh, and 1773 that regulated colonial paper money. They weren't aiming for the colonies to print their own money. During the American Revolution, the colonies became independent states. They were free from British monetary regulations. So they issued paper money to pay for military expenses. It was called continentals. Revolutionary money was referred to as continentals. The paper money issued by the Continental Congress started in May 1775 with an act of Congress. <clears throat> I don't think this, this one here is showing. <clears throat> now, coins were so scarce during the period of the American Revolution that the Continentals was supposedly the only money in circulation. Anyone refusing to accept the money was branded a traitor. And this was continental money. But another problem that they had was the British successfully waged economic warfare by counterfeiting. They counterfeited continental on a large scale. They flooded the New England states with counterfeit money. Benjamin Franklin later wrote, the artists they employed performed as well, performed so well, that immense quantities of these counterfeits, which issued from the British government in New York, were circulated among the inhabitants of all the states before the fraud was detected. This operated significantly in depreciating the whole mass of continental paper money. Does anyone know how much a soldier's pay was in 1776? If he signed up for the Red Army, this wasn't militia pay, this was Red Army pay. He was promised a bounty for wages, uniforms, and 100 acres of land. A private to pay monthly was $6.67. But the Continentals found that their pay, because of inflation and counterfeiting, had gone from $30 paper money to $1 of hard coin by 1778. So three years after the war started in 75, within three years, their money had gone from thirty dollars to a dollar of hard coin. Irregardless, in May 1781, continental dollars had become so worthless they ceased to exist or circulate as money. Nobody would take it. There was no such thing as British gold or silver coins in the colonies, as the British had put a no transfer on gold or silver to the colonies. The royalty wanted all the gold and silver to stay in Britain. So French, Franks, and Spanish pieces of eight were used in the colonies as legal tender for trading and paying debts. The Spanish gold guinea, the German failure, Spanish real, which is a Spanish piece of eight. Because of a tremendous shortage of small silver currencies, the Spanish reel was cut into smaller pieces or bits. Thus the nickname, pieces of eight or bits. One bit equals 12 and a half cents. Two bits equals 25 and a half cents. Four bits equals 50 cents. And I know all of you have heard the old football game. 
two bits, four bits, six bits a dollar, all for you, Kate, stand up and holler. The love story go along with this. Does anyone know why the edges of coins are mended with ridges? So that people wouldn't cut off the edge and right. keep the money. People would take smooth coins when they was making smooth coin. They would shave them real gently. <clears throat> they would shave them real gently. Just get a little bit, not much, just, just a little bit. And they say, well, over a period of a year, they shave a little bit off every coin coming through their hands. If they were a dealer or something, they, they make pretty good money that way. In a year's time, they have another piece of eight, which was another dollar. Raised edges were put on the edge of coins to stop the thievery. At the close of 1779, when they stopped the printing presses, the commissioners were dismissed, and the depreciation of the paper currency had reached zero. More than $242 million had been put in circulation, had been printed. $242 million. $200 million of this remained unredeemed in the hands of the public. During the two preceding years, the whole amount of specie, which is money returned to the Treasury, received in the Continental Treasury was only $156,000. And they printed $242 million. And they only got back $156,000. Weighing in gold, about 700 pounds. Or being in bulk, less than the contents of a good sized wheelbarrow. <clears throat> it was not until 1792 that the United States established a completely new currency system. They replaced shillings with decimal fractions of the dollar. <coughs> Thomas Jefferson coined the term for a coin that he does not live on, which was the dime, one tenth of a dollar. In 1792, Currency was brought basically to the size that we have now and the amounts that we have now. Up until then, it was in, uh, you see on, on one paper, the amounts that it was printed in was like $40. Why? Wow. They printed in all amounts a third of a dollar. One of those little ones is a third of a dollar. It, the system was hard. That pretty well covers our money segment of the program. Next, we're going to talk about soldiers, uniforms, misconception about uniforms. To have uniforms all the same was always a goal. Even by the end of the Revolutionary War, it still was not realized. The only way that it most of those items are through old paintings. There is a book named What Clothes Were Built by an author her name is Linda Baumgartner. On four pages she mentions that during the 1750s French Indian Wars, Colonel George Washington favored Indian dress for his soldiers and officers rather than regimental uniforms. He found the troops wearing leggings, which Bobby and the uh, leggings. Troops wearing leggings or Indian boots. <coughs> they wear those along with the honey frogs. This is the drop here too. 
They were more fit for service on the frontier wearing this. The dyed clothing, the uh, green, put your blue back now, yeah. This green outfit, I bought this from a lady in uh, central Kentucky. She made a lot of clothes. This is dyed with walnut hulls. She got a walnut hulls, a washed up full of rainwater, soaking real good into something I don't mind them dry. And it, I don't think it has faded very much, has it faded very little in its face. It's sure a little bit. You've worn a lot. They also use as dye berries, roots, on and so forth. Lips pants. They were white, white pants and white shirt. Now when you see a movie, you see the red coated British over on the hill. That's accurate. But the movies are not accurate when showing regiments of blue coats. That is not a true picture. It's been estimated by some researchers that as many as 90% of the regular infantry wore everyday civilian clothing as late into the war as 1781. That would be nine out of every 10 soldiers were wearing civilian type clothing. Some of the SAR chapters love to push the uniform. The uniform is, they think it's the most fantastic thing that there was. But only one out of their 10 soldiers had one of them. So you can't say that's a true uh, reputation of a, a soldier when he's wearing a blue uniform in the movie, because very few of them have, very few. General Washington came to favor the use of overalls. That's not to be confused with Bill overalls that we're talking about today. These were long pants that covered the overall leg. Didn't have to use long stockings with them. They weren't short. That was an overall. Some men had them, but it's granted most soldiers served in short breeches and stockings, though some of them had half gaiters to protect them all the way. By 1776, as the war continued and uniforms wore out, all the colonies had trouble keeping the soldiers properly clothed. The first uniforms were ones that the British had given to militia troops because every town had its own militia and they would give them militia troops uniforms. Of course those were wore out by 1776 they were already wore out. In 1777 some uniforms made in France were issued to the Continental Army. Some regiments received blue coats with red faces. Some received wound coats with lead, uh, red facings. The facings are the collars, not the, the uniform, the uniform, yeah. That's the collars, the facings is the collars, the cuffs, and the tie back tables. In 1779, George Washington stepped in as commander in chief and issued orders regarding the regulation of army uniforms. He established his for uniforms for various regiments. All troops were to have blue wool coats. The coat was to be blue. The color of the facings would be determined by four regions. The mid-Atlantic states were to have red facings like this. This was Pennsylvania, New York, New Jersey, 
Washington regulations went on to stipulate that hats were to be a typical British cock style hat, like Bob has on. With white bindings and overalls. Long trousers were to be worn in place of bridges and gaiters. He was very adamant about wearing the long bridges uh, to the point that some of his uh, Regimental commanders threatened to cut his throat if he didn't stop it. They didn't like the long pants, and I, I don't understand why. I don't think more so you would rather have them than have the stockings, short breeches and stockings. This
Don't worry about the food. You're going to get the quality for each day. But then, I don't think that they come. I don't quarter master somebody. Did they have barrels of this and they hand it out? Well, yeah, I got it. It was, it was nice. They had a whole bunch of little jars. Oh, no, this, 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 this is strictly. This is strictly for display. This right. is just, I, I couldn't get it in my hand, so we put it in these little jars just, just to right. show people. That's that's what a half a cup of right. cornmeal looks like. So somebody would have it up. That's what a cup of beans would look like. But mostly what they would do was, like for dinner, they were uh, cook, cooking mites. So there would be six of them in a group that would cook all their stuff together. And I'll cook this week, you cook next week. Mm -hmm. Bob cook the next week. I'm swap that one. It was one of my, one of the books that explains it. One person that didn't have a established cook. I imagine it all tasted the same, you know. <laughs> they were getting basically the same thing. Week after week after week. And especially when they were in camp. Most people think of fighting wars like the Second World War or Vietnam or you've got a line and you're trying to advance your line all the time. The Revolutionary War wasn't like that. They would fight a battle, they would fall back into their camps, their forts, lick their wounds, and it may be three months before they went to battle again. They'd find out a big movement was making a place somewhere, so one side would pick up and go try to stop the other side. And then they'd fall back into their camps or forts. There's a whole lot of Civil War references to heart attack. Yeah. Any difference? No. It, it basically, it's, it's ship's biscuits. That was what they were called when the Romans took Great Britain. And basically, the, the, it's never changed. All we did was mix flour, a little bit of water, and a pinch of salt. And just mashed them out into the hard tacks that you see and started on the road to cook. And that's all the hard stuff. I mean, you, I don't know what the benefits would be. Okay. And they did have factories around that we were in factories and shipped them to the battles, didn't they? In barracks. Yeah, in barracks. They had a big part of the ship in barracks. How common was it for our soldiers to uh, not give rations on certain days? Very common. Very common. That's why the militia basically did their own uh, requisition. In other words, you had a hog out there. We couldn't give them a hog right and eat. Now they did do one thing, that's where the, a lot of SAR and DAR people join the societies on the basis of supplies. They would give, as if they killed your hog, they would give you a requisition slip entitling you to be paid for that hog at the end of hostilities. And you would get your money from most of the time Militias, the state governments pay militias. But they would pay give you money to the hog. Well, if those people were smart enough and saved the papers, then you could join on them being a patriot from furnishing supplies. You explain those black shoes? I don't think you explained the black shoes. Oh, okay. These shoes, now this is, of course, these are brand new, but this is a set of shoes that you could buy back then. The funny thing about those shoes is they're both just alike. You don't have a right, you don't have a left. They just made them, I can't think of an iron hand for shoemakers. But they, they just made one side of the shoe. Or they made one shape of shoe. Right? They would make them in different sizes, but they made one shape of shoe. 
Both of them are just alike. So what you do, you would get on it, you put them on your feet, and you make your feet tell them which foot it was. We shoot, and you kept wearing the same one on the same foot all the time. The shoe would finally form, you know how I've seen people with shoes run over so bad that they just flop out on the side? Basically, that's what these would do. They uh, buckle, they save the buckle from the shoe to shoe. Uh, you can put them on your next set of shoes and they work just fine. The bag down here, this bag is, this is a possible bag. You use that bag for anything you possibly need it. <laughs> They needed them for everything because, in all honesty, a lot of these clothes have got uh, pockets on them, but they didn't put pockets on clothes back then. So the men had to carry their man purse, but they called it a possible's bag. Anything you possibly need to carry around. Here. This other bag here. This is what most people carry, women carry them too. They were haversacks, called a haversack. The soldiers were issued haversacks that were made basically like this, but they also would paint them. They'd take paint and paint them and uh, run waterproof to a certain degree. Ha, 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 ha. 